century, President Kennedy was assassinated, elevating Vice President Lyndon Johnson to the White House. Journalist Max Holland tracks the 36th President of the United States with transcripts of his conversations on the Kennedy assassination, the ensuing Warren Commission, and its aftermath. The Kennedy assassination tapes is this week's History on Book TV feature. It's 45 minutes. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Barnes & Noble of Georgetown. In tonight's featured book, The Kennedy Assassination Tapes, longtime Washington journalist Max Holland presents a momentous, the momentous telephone calls of President Johnson that he made and received as he sought to stabilize the country and keep the government functioning after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Each page of the Kennedy assassination tapes allows us to be the proverbial fly on the wall in the Oval Office as President Lyndon Johnson wrestles with the personal and political transition of leadership inside the White House. Max Holland is an award-winning journalist who has worked in Washington, D.C. for more than 20 years. His articles have appeared in many major newspapers, including the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and Boston Globe. We are pleased to welcome him to discuss the Kennedy assassination tapes, and please help me welcome Max Holland. Thank everyone for coming here. I know <clears throat> there are a lot of events competing for our attention these days, politics and baseball. I got interested in the uh, Johnson tapes in about 1995 as I was doing work on a history of the Warren Commission. Most of the books on the assassination are more or less adversarial in nature, arguing who done it or who didn't do it. I started a book on the Warren Commission in the belief that History alone has that explanatory power to make sense out of the assassination and its aftermath. I soon realized that the tape recordings, which began to be released in 1993, contained information that you could not find elsewhere. If nothing else, they were a very sobering lesson in the limits of writing history from memoirs or documents alone. There simply was some information on the tapes you could not find elsewhere. They truly are, as Lyndon Johnson called them once, history with the bark off. They're what really happened before it's been rinsed for public consumption. Now, in 1997, historian Michael Beschloss published the first in what he called a series of books on the Johnson Conversations. My first reaction to that book was, <coughs> I wish I had had that idea, because I thought it was a very good one. My second reaction was that he saved me from doing a lot of work because, ironically, although I did this book, the one part of my job I probably dislike the most is transcribing conversations, transcribing interviews, including my own. Then I had a third reaction, though, when I heard him talk about some of the conversations in the book, particularly one from September 18, 1964, because his description of it was at odds with what I believed to be the case of what happened on that day. He said, this is Beschloss being interviewed, that Johnson and Russell disbelieved the Warren report, its most important finding, which was that a single bullet had traversed President Kennedy and hit Governor Conley, and therefore two of the most important men in the country didn't believe the Warren report from the get-go. The implication being if they didn't believe it, then we shouldn't believe it either. Beschloss was followed in uh, succeeding years by many other authors who have looked at the conversations and who have likewise misunderstood and misrepresented them, I believe. So I decided to do this book as sort of a prequel to my book on the Warren Commission, sort of a correct the record exercise. But as I did it, I realized it told a very important story, which is the arc of Lyndon Johnson's reaction to and knowledge about the Kennedy assassination. It shows how the assassination cast a shadow over his presidency and his administration that easily equaled the shadow cast by Vietnam. The tapes show that the assassination weighed hev as heavily on Johnson as the Vietnam War did. And it puts into very stark relief a quote that he told Go Doris Curden's Goodwin 
when she prepared her biography in 1976. This is Johnson speaking. I took the oath. I became president. But for millions of Americans, I was still illegitimate, a naked man with no presidential covering, a pretender to the throne, an illegal usurper. And then there was Texas, my home, the home of both the murder and the murder of the murderer. And then there were the bigots and the dividers and the Eastern intellectuals who were waiting to knock me down before I could even stand up. The whole thing was almost unbearable. Now, for the balance of my talk, I'd like to focus on a few select conversations that I've chosen because they're both very telling and also the, audio, the audio quality should be good enough for you to discern the words. Not all the conversations, unfortunately, are that clear. But these, I believe, will work. The Air Force One tapes from November 22nd, because some of the earliest tape recordings are from Air Force One and the ride back from Dallas to Washington, are the audio equivalent of the Zapruder film. That is, if JFK dies anew before our eyes every time we see the Zapruder film, when you listen to the tapes, it's akin to hearing the news for the first time. The first tape I'm going to play is of Pierre Salinger, also known as Wayside, his Secret Service code name, talking to the Situation Room, a Navy commander named Oliver Hallett. It shows the chaos in the highest reaches of the United States government, the lack of any prepara preparation for such a contingency. And at the same time, it shows why this very painful transition came to be regarded as Lyndon Johnson's finest hour. Uh, Wayside is off the line. This is a regular operator, sir. 
understand, uh, this is... Uh, hold on the line there, Wayside. We have uh, some more information coming up. This is uh, Situation Room. I read uh, from the AP bulletin, uh, Kennedy apparently shot in head. He fell face down in back seat of his car. Blood was on his head. Mrs. Kennedy cried, oh, no, and tried to hold up his head. Connolly remained half-seated, slumped to the left. There was blood on his face and forehead. The president and the governor were rushed to Parkland Hospital near the Dallas Trademark where Kennedy was to have made a speech. Over. I read that. Over. Uh, this is Situation Room. I have nothing further for you now. I will uh, contact you if we get more. Police side is Roger now. Now, I don't have time to play <clears throat> the tapes that show how an all but forgotten vice president has the full tonnage of the federal government fall on his shoulders, but <clears throat> that is one of the most important stories in the first days of the Johnson presidency. The second story that's of great importance is the formation of the Warren Commission, and this is particularly why history with the Barkoff is interesting, because if you were to read Johnson's memoir, you would think that from his description of the Warren Commission that he, the idea was relayed to him after Oswald was killed on November 24th, he immediately thought it was a good idea and s thought about appointing the commission, set about doing so. That's far from what actually happened. <coughs> the next conversation is between Bill Moyers, a Johnson aide, and Eugene Rostow, the dean of Yale Law School. Rostow is calling Moyers to suggest what becomes the Warren Commission. This is on Sunday just a few hours, maybe 45 minutes, or less than a few hours, 45 minutes after Oswald has been declared dead. Rostow understands, as few Americans do, th the importance of a purgative effect of a trial, of due process. And now that due process has been denied for Oswald, there has to be some mechanism set up so that the American people can experience the satisfaction that a trial would have brought. He suggests a blue ribbon panel, perhaps even putting Richard Nixon on it. Jim is just now so shaken by the behavior of the Dallas police that they're not believing anything. That's, uh, I can understand that. Now, I've got a party here. We've, I've been pursuing the, the policy, you know, that people need to come together at this time. And you know what you could do that would be very helpful, and this is a, this is a good suggestion, and I'll pass it on just a minute to President Carter. Hello? Yes, sir. Sure. Yes, sir. Excuse me, go ahead. Good, uh, Can I do this little help? Well, I was just thinking coming in a few minutes ago after hearing the news of Oswald shooting that this is symptomatic of what has been happening in this country in the last few years and the breakdown of respect for law and order, you know, the, the, the signs of impeach the Supreme Court, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If I could have a memorandum to give to the president along these lines, if one of his great tasks is to help, you know, continue the institutions that seem to be uh, at least, if, if not in doubt right now, at least uh, weakened by some kind of sickness that has taken hold of some parts of our population. Uh, I'd like him to, 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 to have that to consider in, in some private talks he's having with newsmen and with uh, uh, perhaps for his joint session next Wednesday night. Uh, he needs to make some point, you know, that, that America is known as a land of public order, a land of uh, civility, a land of in which the public safety is guaranteed. and. And uh, there's a very serious question right now in the mind of the world about these institutions that undergird us so tremendously. And uh, his, his Gettysburg speech uh, last spring was just terrific. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'll be glad to send any memo. All right. Be careful right away. All right. Now, your suggestion is that he appoint a special commission of distinguished Americans, primarily in the field of law, I presume, yeah. to look into the whole question of the assassination. All right. All right. Report on it. Uh, all right, I'll get that to him also. I wish you would keep me informed about how Nick is 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 doing. We don't want to put any greater strain on him than is necessary. Uh, but uh, well, he's, he's an able boy. man. Utmost faith in him. But yes. He's he's fighting back. All right. Terrific strain. Thanks for calling. I'll t I'll follow through. Right. Goodbye. Now the idea of a special commission is inter entertained by Lyndon Johnson, but he had already set the FBI in motion after Oswald was killed while in Dallas police custody. And also state authorities in Texas had launched an investigation. All this was on the advice of Abe Fortas, who was a Johnson advisor on political and legal matters. And he cautioned Johnson very strongly and urged him not to let the White House get involved in any investigation of his predecessor's murder. So Johnson took the position on Monday against federal intervention in a state matter. And the reason that it had to be prosecuted at the state level was as, as hard it is, as it is to believe today, uh, killing a president was not a federal crime, not a federal capital crime. The most that Oswald could have been prosecuted for under federal law was a, an assault on a federal officer carrying a maximum five years in jail. So you had the FBI and the Texas State Attorney General involved. <coughs> Johnson then learns on Monday, to his chagrin, that his first significant decision is being second-guessed. He's particularly upset when he learns that the Washington Post is planning to have an op, an editorial, which will call for a federal commission along the lines of the one Rostow recommended. So he calls J. Edgar Hoover hoping to enlist the FBI director in influencing the Washington Post not to make such a call. The Washington Post, of course, even then was a very influential paper. It's the paper read in Washington by all the journalists who work here. What Hoover says is very memorable. He regards the Washington Post as akin to the Daily Worker, which, of course, was the organ of the U.S. Communist Party. things. Uh, apparently some lawyer in justice is lobbying with the Post because uh, that's where the suggestion came from to, to this presidential commission, which we think would be very bad. Uh, I put it right in the White House. And, uh, we can't be uh, checking up on every uh, every uh, uh, shooting spree in the country, but they ain't gone to the Post now to get them an editorial, and the Post is calling up saying they're going to run an editorial if we don't do things. Now, we're going to do two things, and I want you to know about one. We believe that the way to handle this is, uh, as we said uh, yesterday, your suggestion that you, whatever facilitates your command and making a full report to the Attorney General, and then uh, they make it available to the country in whatever form is, uh, seem, may seem desirable. Right. Well, the president. Second, well, the state, it's a state matter, too, and the state Attorney General is young and able and prudent and very cooperative with you. Yeah. He's going to run a, a court of inquiry, which is provided for by state law, and he's going to have associated with him the most outstanding uh, jurist in the country, but he's a good uh, conservative fellow. Yeah. And uh, we don't uh, start invading uh, local jurisdictions that way, and he understands what you're doing, and he's for it. And I want you to understand what he was doing, and and he's very strong for it. He's going to announce it today. Now, if you get too many too many cooks uh, messing with the broth, they'd mess it up. And, yeah. and I think that these two are trained organizations. Yeah. And uh, the Attorney General of the state holds courts of inquiries every time a law is violated. Yeah. And uh, the Justice uh, and the FBI makes these investigations. So I want you to know that. You ought to tell your press man that that's what's happening. And they can expect that they can expect Wagner Carr, the Attorney General of Texas, to make an announcement this morning. Yeah. Uh, of a state inquiry, and that uh, uh, you can offer him your full cooperation, and uh, uh, vice versa, he'll do it with you. Right. We'll, wait, we'll both work together. And any influence you got with the post, to uh, have them point out to him that you don't want too many things, and it, just picking out a Tom Joey lawyer from New York, send him down on new facts, 
this commission thing, Mr. It, uh, Mr. Herbert Hoover tried that, and sometimes a commission that's not trained hurts more than helps. It's a regular circus, then. That's right. Because it'll be covered by TV and everything. Just like an investigating yeah, committee. Exactly. I, I don't have much influence at the post because I frankly I don't know. read it. <laughs> I, 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 I know that. I, know that. I do it like a daily work. You, you told me that once before. <laughs> but uh, but I, I just want your people to know the facts, yeah. and your people can say that, and that kind of negates it, you see. Yes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll take care of that. Thank, Thank you, Mr. President. So then the question is, what changes Lyndon Johnson's mind? But because by Thursday, Thanksgiving Day, he's calling people and announcing his appointment of the Warren Commission. I believe that there are two developments. First, Congress begins to stir in action. The Senate Internal Security Subcommittee announces an investigation. This subcommittee was chaired by Senator James Eastland, who was your prototypical Southern senator. He was very anti-communist, uh, which was fined by Johnson. Problem was that Eastland tended to see communists everywhere. If there was going to be an investigation by the Senate, that also meant there would be investigation by the House, the House Judiciary Committee, which, in contrast to the Senate, was extremely liberal and was likely to try and look for a right-wing conspiracy in Dallas. And the House Un-American Activities Committee had also announced an investigation. So you had the specter of competing congressional committees, each trying to outdo the other, get more headlines in what was going to be an election year. What made it even more sensitive was that when Oswald went to Mexico City some six weeks before the assassination, he had been captured on routine CIA surveillance of the communist embassies in Mexico City. Now, this was extremely secret sources and methods, uh, techniques used during the Cold War. And of course, the CIA was very worried that these congressional committees would compromise the facts of what we knew about Oswald's activities in Mexico City. Not only that, it would be extremely embarrassing to the Mexican government because they cooperated in maintaining the, maintaining the surveillance on the communist embassies. So the CIA was very worried. The State Department was also very worried. But the man who probably does more to change Johnson's mind is Richard Russell, his mentor in the Senate. He's one of the few persons that Johnson actually listens to on the tape recordings. Most of the other people, he's cajoling or overpowering. But when Russell speaks, Johnson listens. And when they have lunch on Tuesday, I think to, somewhat to Johnson's surprise, he finds Russell much more concerned about exposure of CIA sources and methods than he is about federal intervention in a state matter. Now, Russell was also a Southerner from Georgia. He was the leader of the Southern Bloc in the Senate, but he was much more worried about the exposure of the CIA. So that serves to convert Johnson to the commission. And in the next conversations, you find him in his fabled persuasiveness. Uh, the next conversation I'm going to play is with Jim Eastland on Thanksgiving Day. He's calling Eastland because he wants to tell him to drop his investigation because he's going to appoint the commission. He neglects, however, to tell Eastland that he's going to appoint Earl Warren because he knows that would raise Eastland's ire. I'm an investigation uh, situation. Uh, What's your committee plan to do on it? I didn't ask you that, and I intended to, and that is my mind, and I got to talking to it. And well, it we plan to uh, hold hearings and just make a record of what the proof is, that's all. Uh -huh. To show that this man was the assassin. Uh -huh. uh, to begin with, we've had a great number of senators that have come to us to request to begin it with more that it be done. Mm. Now, if you want it dropped, we can drop it. I had this feeling, I don't know, it's very confidential, I haven't proposed it to anybody, and I don't know that I would, but uh, we've got a pretty strong state rights question here, and I have had uh, some hesitancy to uh, just start having a bunch of congressional inquiries into violation of a state statute. And it might... Well, you see, might, we've got a bill in to make it a... Yeah, I know it, but you haven't got any law, and uh, it might set a precedent that you wouldn't want to have. I talked to 
some of the fellows about it day before yesterday. Russell uh, was down here for lunch. And one out in it already. Now, my thought would be this, if we could do it. We might get uh, two members from each body. You see, we're going to have three inquiries running as it is. Well, I wouldn't want that. That wouldn't do. And if we could have uh, two congressmen and two senators and maybe a justice Supreme Court and take the FBI report and review it and write a report and do anything they felt like needed to be done, I think it would... Uh, this is a very explosive thing and could be a very dangerous thing to the country. Well, and a little publicity uh, could just fan the flames. What would you think well, about... What would you think about... Uh, uh, if we could work it out of getting somebody in the court, somebody in the House, and somebody in the Senate and have a real uh, high-level judicial uh, uh, study of all the facts. Well, it would suit me all right. Now, you'd have, there's going to be some opposition on the committee from Keeney, and uh, I think that's going to be all right. I don't know. He's very strong for it. No, well, he, all it's all right with you. I'm not worried about your committee. I know what you can well, handle. Right, you can handle your committee. Okay. Much better. Okay. Bye. I don't know if you noticed, but he turned the state's rights argument on its head, whereas before he'd used it to argue against federal intervention. Now he was telling Eastland, well, you're going to have all these congressional committees looking into a state matter, and doesn't that go against your ideology? Now, the conversation with Richard Russell the next day in which he tells Russell he's going to be on the commission is fascinating. It's a great lesson in Johnson's ability to cajole, bully, uh, and get people to serve even when they don't want to. Russell, frankly, detests Earl Warren. He doesn't want to serve on the Warren Commission. For the duration, it's not called the Warren Commission in Richard Russell's Senate office. It's the President's Commission or the Assassination Committee. It's never called the Warren Commission in Russell's office. Uh, but unfortunately, that conversation is a little too long. But it's easily the testiest conversation between the two men. And Russell, finally, although he's very angry at being sandbagged by Johnson, recognizes that if he doesn't serve, if he renounces the announcement that Johnson has made that he's going to be on the commission it would be a very severe blow to his disciple. So ultimately he does agree to serve. Now there are other tapes that show a side of Johnson that we don't often see that I consider assassination related and some of these have to do with Jack Jacqueline Kennedy. Um, I'd like to play one for you right now. In the immediate aftermath of the assassination, Johnson has numerous conversations with the former First Lady, and they show a side for, of him that uh, the American public, I don't think, really ever sees. this time and then to send me that thing today of, you know, the tape announcement and everything. I want you to just know that, so I told my mama a long time ago, when everybody else gave up about my election in 48, yeah. my mother and my wife and my sisters and you females got a lot of courage that we men don't have. And so we have to rely on you and depend on you and you got something to do. Uh, you got some courage, don't rely on you. And this is not the first thing you have to so there are not many women, you know, running around with a good many presents. So you just, uh, you just got that <laughs> now, and you got the biggest job of your life. You run around with two presidents. That's what they say about me. <laughs> okay, anytime. Well, Thank you for yeah. calling, Mr. President. Goodbye. Uh, you come back. I will. <laughs> well, you... Hmm. Despite her promise to come visit Johnson in the White House, she actually never does. Uh, and Johnson takes this very personally, although I don't believe it had anything to do with him. It was simply too painful for her to come back. The first time she does come back is during the administration of Richard Nixon. Uh, 
nonetheless, this sends a lot of tongues wagging in Washington. The idea is that she's as alienated from the Johnsons as Robert Kennedy is. Now, the Warren Commission and the investigation of the assassination is not a topic of many conversation in the 10 months that the Warren Commission meets. But there is one very important conversation from the September 18, 1964. I referred to it earlier. This is the conversation between Russell and Johnson. It's on the day that the Warren Commission meets for the last time. And the reason it is so important is because there's almost no other contemporary contemporaneous record of what transpired that day. Warren considered the Warren Report akin to Brown versus the Board of Education. He wanted a unanimous report, but he didn't want to let the American people see what they had to do in order to get there, akin to the American people not knowing how the Supreme Court justices reach a unanimous decision on a Supreme Court verdict. So there is no mi minutes of the last meeting although minutes had been taken of all the previous sessions. So this conversation between Johnson and Russell is extremely significant because it shows Russell's reservations about the commission and what he did to change the language. Now in Beschloss's rendition, and one of the things that struck me about it was he has the words little old threat, meaning that Warren threatened Russell in some, with some unknown consequences if he desisted from signing a unanimous report. What Russell actually says is little old thread because he came in with some dissents and Warren, because he wanted a unanimous report, massaged the language until Russell had no ground to dissent on. And that was what was said, not that Warren issued a threat against Russell. If that had happened, I believe all hell would have broken loose. The other aspect about this conversation, though, that's very important has to do with the single bullet conclusion. This is another of Russell's dissents. He doesn't believe that a single bullet passed through John, uh, President Kennedy before hitting Governor Conley. Now, he hadn't studied this aspect very carefully. His main concentration, insofar as he worked on the Warren Commission, was to look for a communist conspiracy. Uh, when he didn't find one, his interest waned dramatically. So he didn't believe this because Conley insisted that he'd been hit by his own bullet. And Richard Russell wasn't going to have Earl Warren's commission contradict the word of an honorable Southern governor, even though it made no sense. And when he says, I don't believe in it because it doesn't matter, well, it couldn't have mattered more. And when Johnson says, I don't believe in it either, it's just an example of Johnson speaking for effect. He doesn't even understand what the issues are. And this has been distorted by writers about the assassination and Johnson to suggest that the two, two of the most important men in the government didn't believe in the Warren Report from the get-go. Superficially, that's true, but it, it's also very untrue to suggest that. Thank you. 
Well, what, what difference did it make which bill it got Connolly? Well, it don't make much difference, but they said that, uh, that they believe, that the committee, be the commission believe that the same bullet that hit, didn't hit Connolly. Well, I don't believe it. I don't either. And so I couldn't sign it. And I, I said that Governor Connolly testified directly to the contrary, and I'm not going to approve of that. So I finally made them say there was a difference in the commission in that. Part of them believed that that, uh, that wasn't so. And, uh, of course, if a fellow was accurate enough to hit Kennedy right in the neck on one shot and knock his head off the next one, when he was leaning up against his wife's head and not even wound up, well, he didn't miss completely with that third shot. According to that theory, he not only missed the whole automobile, but he missed the street. Well, the man's good enough shot to put two bullets right into Kennedy. He didn't miss that old automobile and all the street. Anyhow, that's just a little thing. But we what is the, what's the net of the whole thing? What does it say? It's Oswald did it, and he did it for any reason? Well, just that he was a general uh, misanthropic fellow that he uh, had never been satisfied anyway. He was on Earth in Russia or here, and that he had a desire to get his name in history and all. I don't think you'll be displeased with reports too long, but it's a uh, whole volume. Unanimous? Yes, sir. Yeah. I tried my best to get in a dissent, but they'd come around and trade me out of it by giving me a little old thread of it. Too. Now I'll move to the fall of 1966. <clears throat> Very significant time for Johnson. Up until now, the transition had been seen as his finest hour. The Warren Report was accepted more or less as the last word on the assassination. But beginning in the summer, books critical of the Warren Report begin to be published, two of whom, two of which are bestsellers. The criticism of the report ranges from the deserved, because the Warren Report wasn't a perfect document, to the dishonest. Strikingly, Johnson believes that Robert Kennedy is behind the criticism. This comes out in a conversation with Abe Fortas in October 66, one of the most recent conversations released by the Johnson Library. I thought I had heard everything until I heard this conversation, but then Johnson blames Robert Kennedy because he believes that Robert Kennedy is attempting to put his first decision in a bad light. And if the Warren Commission didn't get to the bottom of the matter, it's going to reflect on Lyndon Johnson. So the report starts to come under attack. Then another development, early in the fall around Labor Day, rumors begin to circulate about a book by William Manchester. And it's a very striking book. Today, perhaps, it wouldn't be so striking, but in those days, to have a major publisher like Harper and Rowe violate the norms by which presidents were treated was very remarkable. Johnson was depicted in the book, which was the Kennedy's official history of the assassination, or authorized history, as an unworthy successor, a usurper, someone who grabbed the accoutrements of power hastily. He insisted on being sworn in before the plane left Dallas. He insisted on moving into the Oval Office the next day. He was inconsiderate of Jacqueline Kennedy, li literally dragging her out of her stateroom so she could be photographed next to him in that very famous picture aboard Air Force One. Finally, and most unfairly, Johnson is depicted as the personification of the Texas forces responsible for the assassination, violence, and extremism. The stories, this story is told in conversations that Johnson has with Bill Moyers and Abe Fortas from December 66. They're very long conversations. His aides want to counterattack in the press by leaking accounts that would be favorable to Johnson to show how kindly he treated Mrs. Kennedy, as evidenced by that telephone call earlier. But the offense to Johnson pride is immeasurable. His very being as a politician is under attack. It's existential in nature. And his frustration is particularly evident in the conversation he has with Bill Moyers on the day after Christmas. And I'd just like to read very briefly from this. One of the allegations that Manchester is allegedly going to publish, because the book doesn't come out until the spring of 1967, is that Johnson called Mrs. Texas, Mrs. Kennedy honey. 
And this is Johnson almost shouting. I never said to anybody that I called her honey because that was the Texas way. I don't believe that's the Texas way. I think I would call people honey because if I felt they were honey. And I might have very well said to Mrs. Kennedy, although I never felt that way about her and never believed it. I have held her kind of on a pedestal and been very reserved with her, as her letters to me will indicate. Very proper, very appropriate, very dignified, very reserved, as I don't think I called Mrs. Rose Kennedy honey. I think that's the creature of someone's imagination. How can I not, re not recollect it when it just didn't happen? Finally, I'd like to draw your attention to conversations from the spring of 1967 when the other j shoe dropped, so to speak. This is after months of articles in the press following up the books that have been critical of the Warren Report. Life and the Saturday Evening Post have major investigative stories pointing up all the defaults or defects in the Warren Report. And finally, a heretofore obscure district attorney in New Orleans, Jim Garrison, announces that he's reopening the case in February 1967. This, of course, causes a media firestorm in New Orleans. And what you see from the conversations is a very intricate interplay between this announced investigation by a district attorney, and everybody believes because he's a district attorney he has something responsible to say about the assassination, and the story, a rumor Johnson has heard about assassination plots against Castro. Now this was told to him in January, a month before Garrison announces his investigation. At first he tends to dismiss this story. It's as if he says someone came up to him and told him that Lady Bird was strung out on heroin. He just refused to, f refuses to believe that there were assassination plots against Castro and more importantly that these assassination plots were done with the full knowledge and even the direction of Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General at the time. And these two developments play off one another until on March 2nd there's a conversation between John Connolly and Lyndon Johnson in which Connolly talks about both the rumors and Garrison's investigation. And Johnson tries to assure him that the FBI has looked into both and believe there's no there there. But on March 2nd, Jim Garrison arrests a New Orleans businessman named Clay Shaw. And that in turn prompts Drew Pearson to write a column about this allegation. Now the column isn't even printed in the Washington Post because it's considered too scurrilous. It's unsourced, it's just a rumor. In fact, the column admits it's just a rumor. But nevertheless, it is printed in many other newspapers that subscribe to the Drew Pearson column nationwide. And because of that column, Ramsey Clark, the Attorney General under Johnson, goes to the FBI and asks them what they know about this rumor which is now in print. About 10 days later, the FBI comes back with a memo entitled, CIA's Intentions to Send Hoodlums to Cuba to Assassinate Castro. And now Johnson knows it's true. He turns to Richard Helms, who's the director of the CIA and was the CIA's liaison to the Warren Commission, and he asks him, I want to know about this. Now, what we don't know is whether Johnson told him, I've heard these rumors and there was a story in the Drew Pearson column, I'd like you to tell me the truth about them, or whether he told Helms, I know from the FBI this is true and I want to know the whole truth. Whatever the case, in May 67, Helms comes back and for an hour in a meeting that's completely unrecorded, tells Johnson the whole truth about the attempts to assassinate Castro, including the employment of the mafia in these attempts in the early 1960s, who authorized them in the Kennedy White House. So Johnson learns eight years before the American people exactly the truth about the plots to kill Fidel Castro. After that, although Earl Warren and J. Edgar Hoover and Richard Helms tried to dissuade him otherwise, Johnson believes that President Kennedy was killed in retaliation for these assassination attempts, and he goes to his death believing that. Now, the importance of that is that it depicts the arc of Johnson's thought and reactions to the assassination, and it shows 
how important the assassination was throughout Johnson's presidency, and that he didn't, in, to my mind, just leave the presidency because of Vietnam, although that was very important. It's almost an article of faith with historians that Johnson left because McCarthy won an unexpectedly large percentage of the vote in New Hampshire primary, and then Johnson, fearing that he would be contested for the renomination, bowed out. But I think if you look at what Johnson understood to be the case in 1968, that he knew that he had replaced the man who had been killed, and he believed in retaliation for the attempts against Castro. And yet he had picked up the pieces. He had followed through on Kennedy's liberal agenda, which Kennedy himself had not been able to get through the Congress. He had passed Medicare, civil rights, and other pieces of legislation that had been stalled for years, if not decades. And still, Johnson was not able to command the loyalty of the liberal intelligentsia of the Democratic Party. He felt that even, even in Vietnam, he had pursued Kennedy's policy. So while I believe he was quite prepared to defend his record against liberals who he felt were betraying him in 1968, the precipitating factor for his withdrawal from the race was Robert Kennedy's entrance. It was the final straw. And in an interview with Doris Kearns, he did say exactly that. And then the final straw. The thing I feared from the first day of my presidency was actually coming true. Robert Kennedy openly announced his intention to reclaim the throne in the memory of his brother. And the American people, swayed by the magic of the name, were dancing in the streets. The whole situation was unbearable for me. After 37 years of public service, I, I deserved something more than being left alone in the middle of the plain, chased by stampedes on every side. That's the end of my formal presentation. I'd be glad to entertain any questions. Yes. Um, are you aware of this? Uh, and my, question, my question would be, um, my understanding is that there was, um, shortly before the Kennedy assassination, an interview that Fidel Castro had with a journalist, I think a French journalist, who, and, and in that conversation, the attempts on Castro's life were mentioned. And Fidel Castro said, well, um, American attempts on his life. And Fidel Castro said something to the effect that, um, well, people that do these things should be careful. They can have them, the very same things done to them. Right. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. what, how do you, how would that fit in with this? Right. It is true that in uh, September 64, Castro made that remark. Uh, I'm sorry, 63. Uh, Castro made that remark. Um, and after the assassination, it took on this ominous tone. Uh, at first, the people in the National Security Council were very dismissive of it. I think what Castro probably was meaning, if he was going to do anything, was uh, he would likely retaliate against American ambassadors in Latin America and probably target them for assassination if there were continuous assassination attempts against him or other members of the Cuban government. I think it would have been reckless in the extreme for him to try, re try to retaliate in kind. It would have been much safer, so to speak, to target American ambassadors. And in fact, there is some evidence that he did think about doing that. Any more questions? Well, with uh, with no other questions, uh, we would. Uh, one, we get, oh. Okay, um, tonight's uh, book is the Kennedy uh, assassination tapes. Alfred Knopp, and please uh, thank with me, Max Holly. Thank you. Everyone, we will be signing books right over here at this table, and I want to thank you very much for coming out and joining us. Thank you. Max Holland is a contributing editor at The Nation magazine and The Wilson Quarterly. The Kennedy assassination tapes is published by Knopf. Visit randomhouse.com slash... ...be the case of what happened on that day. He said, Mrs. Beschloss being interviewed, 
that Johnson and Russell disbelieved the Warren report, its most important finding, which was that a single bullet had traversed President Kennedy and hit Governor Conley, and therefore two of the most important men in the country didn't believe the Warren report from the get-go. The implication being if they didn't believe it, then we shouldn't believe it either. Beschloss was followed in uh, succeeding years by many other authors who've looked at the conversations and who've likewise misunderstood and misrepresented them, I believe. So I decided to do this book as sort of a prequel to my book on the Warren Commission, sort of a correct the record exercise. But as I did it, I realized it told a very important story, which is the arc of Lyndon Johnson's reaction to and knowledge about the Kennedy assassination. It shows how the assassination cast a shadow over his presidency and his administration that easily equaled the shadow cast by Vietnam. The tapes show that the assassination weighed hev as heavily on Johnson as the Vietnam War did. And it puts into very stark relief a quote that he told Go Doris Curtin's Goodwin when she prepared her biography in 1976. This is Johnson speaking. I took the oath. I became president. But for millions of Americans, I was still illegitimate, a naked man with no presidential covering, a pretender to the throne, an illegal usurper. And then there was Texas, my home, the home of both the murder and the murder of the murderer. And then there were the bigots and the dividers and the Eastern intellectuals who were waiting to knock me down before I could even stand up. The whole thing was almost unbearable. Now, for the balance of my talk, I'd like to focus on a few select conversations that I've chosen because they're both very telling and also the, audio, the audio quality should be good enough for you to discern the words. Not all the conversations, unfortunately, are that clear. But these, I believe, will work. Journalist who has worked in Washington, D.C. for more than 20 years his articles have appeared in many major newspapers, including the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and Boston Globe. We are pleased to welcome him to discuss the Kennedy assassination tapes, and please help me welcome Max Holland. I thank everyone for coming here. I know <clears throat> there are a lot of events competing for our attention these days politics and baseball. I got interested in the uh, Johnson tapes in about 1995 as I was doing work on a history of the Warren Commission. Most of the books on the assassination are more or less adversarial in nature, arguing who done it or who didn't do it. I started a book on the Warren Commission in the belief that history alone has that explanatory power to make sense out of the assassination and its aftermath. I soon realized that the tape recordings, which began to be released in 1993, contained information that you could not find elsewhere. If nothing else, they were a very sobering lesson in the limits of writing history from memoirs or documents alone. There simply was some information on the tapes you could not find elsewhere. They truly are, as Lyndon Johnson called them once, history with the bark off. They're what really happened before it's been rinsed for public consumption. Now, in 1997, historian Michael Beschloss published the first in what he called a series of books on the Johnson Conversations. My first reaction to that book was, <coughs> I wish I had had that idea, because I thought it was a very good one. My second reaction was that he saved me from doing a lot of work, because ironically, although I did this book, the one part of my job I probably dislike the most is transcribing conversations, transcribing interviews, including my own. Then I had a third reaction, though, when I heard him talk about some of the conversations in the book, particularly one from September 18, 1964, because his description of it was at odds with what I believed to be three, President Kennedy was assassinated, elevating Vice President Lyndon Johnson to the White House. Journalist Max Holland tracks the 36th President of the United States with transcripts of his conversations on the Kennedy assassination, the ensuing Warren Commission, and its aftermath. The Kennedy assassination tapes is this week's History on Book TV feature. It's 45 minutes. <laughs> 
Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Barnes & Noble of Georgetown. In tonight's featured book, The Kennedy Assassination Tapes, longtime Washington journalist Max Holland presents a momentous, the momentous telephone calls of President Johnson that he made and received as he sought to stabilize the country and keep the government functioning after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Each page of the Kennedy assassination tapes allows us to be the proverbial fly on the wall in the Oval Office as President Lyndon Johnson wrestles with the personal and political transition of leadership inside the White House. Max Holland is an award-winning journalist.